Today's show is brought to you by Audible, and right now you can get a free audiobook download and 30-day free trial at audibletrial.com forward slash joined up. There's over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle or MP3 player. Thanks for tuning in to the Joined Up Writing Podcast, a weekly show featuring interviews with fantastic authors sharing their personal stories on how and why they write. There's hints and tips for aspiring writers and great book reviews from top bloggers. Follow us on Twitter at JU Podcast. Right, cue the cheesy theme tune. Put down your pen and stop your typing. Grab yourself a drink. It's joined up writing. Hello and welcome to the Joined Up Writing Podcast, where a little procrastination can go a long way. I'm Wayne Kelly and it's episode 72 and today I'm talking to debut novelist, podcaster and crowdfunder extraordinaire Claire Hanscom. I've also got a new review from one of our dynamic duo of book bloggers Victoria Goldman in Book Bloggers Corner. It was really interesting to talk to Claire on a number of levels. She's a podcaster, like me, and she's also in the process of pushing her debut novel towards publication, albeit a bit further down the road than I am with my book, and she too has struggled with the traditional stroke independent routes. Uh, of publishing so and, and as it happens she's actually moving forward with a third option that sits somewhere between the two with crowdfunding um, unbound and we talk about that in our interview it was also a chance for me to chat to a fellow podcaster particularly in next week's epilogue episode we talk about that in a bit more detail but about the challenges and questions that uh, that can bring and one of the things we talked about was how much we actually talk about ourselves in our shows and for me I do try to keep these introductions short and to the point as far as I'm concerned you turn up to hear some interesting chat with published authors not to hear me blathering on for hours but it was interesting that I got a very strong response to my introduction on uh, the introduction for the recent interview with Richard Rippon. I just mentioned in passing my quandary about which publishing route to pursue and I had a couple of really nice emails about that and also another offer from someone to beta read an early draft of my novel which I'm yeah, absolutely bowled over by uh, so maybe you do like to hear a little a bit about how I'm getting on and it was humbling to get the response that I did that said I would still love to hear your thoughts on the intro or any other part of the show format so do get in touch and let me know what you think if you want less of me that's fine just let me know Speaking of which, let's get cracking with today's interview with Claire Hanscom. So Claire is a British writer who moved to Washington DC in 2012, ostensibly to study for an MFA, but also because she's a huge fan of the West Wing. She was recently longlisted for the Bath Novel Award and her journalism, poetry and essays have appeared in a wide variety of publications, including Bustle, Book Riot, Writers Forum and The Washington Post. She's also the host of the Brit Lit Podcast, which is a great new fortnightly show featuring news and views from British books and publishing. Okay, Claire, thanks a million for joining us on Joined Up Writing Podcast. How's things? Things are great. Thank you for having me. No, no problem. Uh, I take it you're calling all the way from Washington, D.C., is that right? I am. It's sunny here today, which is nice. It's, yes. It's nice for you. Yeah, it's cold and wet here <laughs> for a change. I'm sure you don't miss that. We'll get into that a little bit later. <laughs> so why don't we start off? Why, why don't you tell us a little bit about how you came to writing in the first place? Uh, was it a lifelong ambition or when did you realize you wanted to kind of take it past the, you know, the sort of hobby stage? Um, I actually wrote quite a lot as a child um, and I wrote poetry that was actually not terrible and possibly <laughs> even good uh, when I was around sort of 10, 11, 12. Um, but I wrote in French back then. My mom is French and I grew up in Belgium. Oh, right. um, and then we moved back to England when I was 12 or 13 and I gradually kind of stopped writing partly because I sort of switched to English being my main language and English wasn't my, I didn't feel the same level of love for English as I did for French. Mm -hmm. um, and also I think the onset of adolescence and therefore writing terrible poems, in fact, course, yeah. about, about get your it crushes yeah, and yeah. how awful <laughs> life is. So, yeah. and then I just kind of, life got busy and I forgot that it was really something that I loved to do. And then 
fast forward to when I was around 30 and got into a show called The West Wing. Mm-hmm. Um, and that, I'm sure we'll talk more about it later, <laughs> but that TV program um, changed my life in lots of ways. And one of the ways that it did is it um, showed me how beautiful English can be um, and how poetic it can be. And it just viscerally reminded me how much I love language. And I basically started writing off the back back of that. So, yeah. yeah. And it kind of, and then, as you say, I mean, I'm sure there's no coincidence in the fact that you're in Washington and you're a huge West Wing super fan. So tell, tell us how you ended up there and uh, how, how that kind of worked out. Yeah, so there is no coincidence. Um, I had never really even wanted to visit America. I was not that into it. I have friends who used to go to New York on shopping trips and things, and I used to think, oh, okay, that's a bit weird, whatever. Um, But then I have a longtime friend, in fact, from my Belgium days, who lives in New York and asked if I wanted to visit. And around the time that I was getting really into the West Wing, I was like, well, yeah, maybe I do want to go. And New York isn't that far from DC. So maybe we could visit DC. So um, I went to New York, we came to visit DC, it was not sunny, it was uh, raining and pretty grim, but I still totally (laughs) fell in love with it. We drove around in the dark with all the monuments lit up, and it looked like a TV set. Um, I love the city. It's very much, it's got everything thing that I love about London without the bits I hate so it's Mm -hmm. got all the restaurants and theaters and lots of culture and lots of intelligent people walking around all the time Mm -hmm. but it doesn't have the sort of rush and stress the overpopulation yeah yes the overpopulation and the noise at least not not in my day-to-day life it might be different if I worked in politics but yeah so um yeah, so I fell in love with DC and I, since I was also falling in love with writing, I applied to do an MFA in creative writing um, at the university in DC. And I didn't get it in the first time, but I got in the second time. So that's how I ended up with a visa and I moved over. And it, and it all went from there. So yeah. was it was it whilst you were doing the qualification that you decided, did it just kind of come out of that, that you decided you were going to try and go a bit more long form and write a novel? No, so I had already been writing a novel. Um, the thing, so I started. This is perhaps slightly embarrassing, but whatever. I started writing fan fiction after watching The West Wing, and then that, then I started writing my own novel um, based um, based in that world. Even though I didn't actually know that much about it, but it led to me researching a lot about American politics as well, and sort of falling in love with that whole thing as well. So yeah, I had already written. Um, actually a couple of novels before I moved here. So, yeah. I don't, I don't think it matters. Uh, I mean, you know, whatever the gateway is into yeah. to doing it, I think it's different for everybody else. You know, for for everybody's kind of got their own way in and it's, you know, no two, two writer's stories are the same. So I don't think it matters. I mean, it's only the same as, you know, a lot of people get into writing through comics or graphic novels. Mm-hmm. And, the, and, and the same goes for artists, actually. I've spoken to a lot of artists and kind of that's how they started off doing you know how they got into art in the first place was from like reading the Beano or, or you know, or, or Roy the Rovers or whatever. And so I don't, I don't think it matters really. It's like a star, isn't it? It's whatever fires your passion. Yeah, yeah. So, so how? So tell us a little bit about um, what will be your debut novel. It's unscripted, isn't it? Is that right? Yes, yeah. So it's called Unscripted. It's about a young woman who has a crush on an actor and she decides that she's going to write a novel and get the actor to read the novel somehow and to to write the script with her. Um, and then as they're writing the script, they're going to fall in love and get married. That's her plan. <laughs> um, obviously, it would not be a great book if that plan <laughs> just, just happens. worked Two pages from A to in, Z. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but parts of it do happen and she gets to meet him. And she also meets a long ago ex-girlfriend of his. Um, and she also has friends um, from her university days that are part of the novel, including one friend who's a guy who may or may not have a bit of a crush on her. So there's there's actually four main characters. But I would say that the main character is Libby, who has this crush on the actor. So yes, that's that's the crux of it. And so you've kind of got multiple uh, POVs in there. Yes. So when did you decide and why did you decide you're going to go that route? Or was it just, it was kind of organic and that's just how it happened? Um, I think it was organic. It, um, I had this idea for a book for quite a while before I started writing it. And I, 
I'm sure we all, to some extent, this happens to everybody, but I was a little bit terrified of how am I going to get into this book? How am I going to start it? Mm -hmm. And I, I had this workbook. I think it's called something like The Plot Whisperer. And it has um, sort of writing prompts, um, you know, like yeah. – um, uh, not not the general writing prompts write about a sunny day or whatever, but like it's it's designed to help you write a novel. So it, it has things like, you know, introduce the antagonist and what they want at this point I kind see. of idea. Yeah, 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 I and see. I think from that, I one of those prompts, probably exactly that one, you know, introduce the antagonist or whatever. I was mm. like, oh, well, what if she had her own point of view? Mm. So I don't know that I went into it originally thinking this is how I'm going to do it, but it just kind of organically happened. And did you, obviously you, t you, you know, you took a formal writing qualification. Yeah. Did How much do you think that influences the way that you write? And I mean, do you approach, have you kind of got like a set way of writing a novel now as a consequence of it? What, what did you kind of take from that? Um, I don't have a set way. It's different every time. I've done uh, NaNoWriMo three times now, which I don't know whether you've talked about that mm. on your podcast before. Mm -hmm. um, it's where you write a first draft in 30 days, basically. And it's a little bit crazy, but Absolutely, and every yeah. single time I think this is not going to happen. How am I going to get to the end of the month <laughs> and have a book? And yet magically it kind of does. It's weird. Mm. Um, well, it's not just magic. It's also hard work. I was going to say it it's does, graft, yeah. Yes. But it does It does feel like my, even every day you sit down and think, how am I going to get 1,667 words out of this? Yeah. And then it just happens. Um, so I've done that a few times. Um, and this book I wrote in actually in the summers of my course because my course ended up being very um, homework heavy and I actually didn't have that much time to write, which mm -hmm. was kind of a bit frustrating because it wasn't really what I, I thought it was I'd a writing up. case. You, you thought it was a writing yeah. course. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, so, and I think, and a lot of MFAs, at least in the US, are very focused on literary fiction. Mm -hmm. And although I do write some stuff that is more literary, this one is um it's what's called in the trade up upmarket women's fiction so mm -hmm. it's sort of it's it's not not literary but it's also not the pretentious you know tortured white man in brooklyn fiction that sure. is kind of the standard w women's fiction, fiction with literary aspiration or something like that <laughs> something like that yeah like i call it I call it beach reads for smart women when I'm trying to describe yeah, what it is, which good, isn't, yeah. isn't to say that men can't enjoy it. I think <laughs> men can too and, you know, whatever. But I just, it's just shorthand, like all these things. Um, but all of which is to say that I think if I hadn't been quite stubborn, I think that the MFA could have knocked a lot of my writing uh, out of me because a lot of what I write is probably not considered, you know, edgy enough or mm -hmm. literary enough or mm -hmm. pretentious enough. Uh, but I knew what I wanted to write. And um, I had already had experience of being in writers groups. So I already knew what it was like to get your writing critiqued, which mm. I think is, was very useful because it can be quite, um, it can be quite hard and quite harsh to have your writing critiqued but I already knew the skill of like okay well this person clearly doesn't get what I'm doing so I'm not sure, going to listen yeah. to them this person has a really good eye for dialogue so I'm going to listen to them when they talk about dialogue sure. I kind of already knew how to do that so that was really helpful um I don't know if that answers your question <laughs> well no no it kind of no it kind of does it's interesting because I've I've spoken to obviously dozens of authors on the podcast and yeah. some some have got formal writing qualifications and some haven't got them, some haven't even got, you know, they've not even got A-levels, let alone gone to university and done yeah. anything else. So everybody, everybody's different and obviously everybody takes different things from it. So it's interesting and it is interesting to hear somebody sort of with that angle of it and, you know, that it maybe wasn't exactly what you were expecting, but I'm sure you got other things out of it as well. What, what about from like yeah. an organisational point of view or, you know, giving you kind of a, because I'm sure the course covered well why don't you give us a bit of an idea of the sorts of things that it did cover what's kind of for people that don't know they haven't taken that kind of qualification what what is the type of thing that's kind of covered by the course yeah so I mean I don't want to give the impression that it was a waste of time or anything it was still you know really great and really interesting and really useful and sure yeah it got me to it got me to DC which is what I wanted as well yeah. but it and it also I think one of the things that it does is it telegraphs to yourself, I'm taking writing seriously. Mm. Um, this is what I do now, <laughs> uh, which I think that's that's very valuable. Um, sure. they're, they're all different. Um, 
the backbone of every MFA and MA as well um, in the UK is um, the writing workshop. So that's basically you, people have your work a week in advance or whatever. They read through it, they make comments, and then you sit there in silence while you listen to everybody like say what they think about your work as if you're not there kind of sure, thing. You're not sure. allowed to to respond or anything, which I used to think was a bit stupid. And there are some circumstances where I still think that's a bit stupid because sometimes people are like, oh, it wasn't clear what year this was taking place. <laughs> and you could just be like, it was 1967, yeah, just I'm right yeah, here. Yeah, yeah. Um, but, but it does help you not be defensive, but just sit there and listen. And it also helps to hear, actually, if people are like, I wasn't clear what year this is, you're like, oh, yeah, yeah. I need to make sure that the so reader is clear. More. Yeah, sure. um, so that's kind of the main, that's the backbone of every writing course. Um, Usually you have to pick whether you're focusing on fiction, nonfiction, poetry or something else. My course was quite um, unusual and also very good in that it let us um, basically do a bit of everything. Mm. So I did um, I focus on fiction, but I did. We all had to take a class in literary journalism, which is kind of like the long pieces that you might get in the New Yorker, sure, that kind yeah. of. Uh, which that was a very valuable um course and they made us take that partly because that's one of the ways in which we can earn actual money so with you our say writing. that you could actually learn, so, earn a living doing that yeah yes um and then they also i think ours i think my course might have been unique in this um there's a poetry translation class we had to take um so i'm lucky in that i speak french but if you don't speak a foreign language you team up with somebody who speaks a foreign language and they kind of tell you what the words mean on a you know literal level and then you sort of go into the sounds and all the different things about poetry uh, so it kind of reintroduced me to poetry as well and I ended up taking a poetry class after that um, and then the the thing that I probably resented the most and which is what took all the time is they made us take liter literature classes but mm -hmm. um, not literature for writers just like as if we were doing an MA in literature so you, it was a yeah. lot of like reading critical theory and stuff like that which is not really my thing sure. um and a lot of time writing papers, which are American essays, which are different from British essays. And I didn't particularly love doing that. That said, though, I did l learn a lot of interesting stuff. I read some books that I've been meaning to read, like Anna Karenina and Crime and Punishment mm -hmm. and, you know, and books that I would never have chosen to read, like The Sound and the Fury. Sure. But which I think were really useful and interesting for me to to learn from and to think about even though i resented it at the time so a bit yeah. like school in general <laughs> yeah basically yeah except with a, with a bit less math and science yeah, yeah. But yeah there's always stuff that you know we have to be forced to do and it's only after the fact we thought oh that's actually quite useful i can see see why we did that now yeah <laughs> so um so obviously you so you 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 know you worked on um unscripted um you got it to a point where you were going to be submitting it and then tell us a little bit about what happened after that so obviously it's on it's kind of on its journey towards publication as we speak so tell us about about that and what's going on with that um yeah so i don't know how much how much background you want but i'll start from the beginning i um submitted it to agents in the usual way that i'm sure your guests mm -hmm. have talked about before um didn't get anywhere i mean i no that's not true some people asked for full the full manuscript but i basically didn't get anywhere with that and then sure, i went yeah. to a writer's um like a one week writer's workshop one summer and the woman who was teaching the class loved my book and basically recommended me to an agent which was amazing and I was like in heaven when that happened and the agent loved my book and she was all like we're gonna sell this and I would hope to get six six figures for it and it's mm -hmm. gonna be great um you can guess where this is going <laughs> <It's>, yeah. <laughs> um, that did not happen it's, yeah well um, unfortunately it's it's a common story you know it's yes. it's not it's not unusual unfortunately uh, I know that now, but I feel yeah. like nobody had prepared. Like getting no, an agent. No, I don't think I don't think they can prepare you for, it, especially especially if you've got yeah. somebody in the industry that's actually saying that to you at the time. I can yeah. imagine that is very very disheartening. Well, getting an agent was the holy grail, and once I had one, I thought that was it. And mm. you know, and I did have. I had a lot of great feedback from editors, and I had one editor who wanted to take my book, but her her boss basically vetoed it. Mm -hmm. So I went as far as to have a conversation with her on the phone and talk about who I knew who could do blurbs and all this kind of thing. Um, so I really thought I was about to get a book deal. And this is after writing seriously for um, 
I guess for at least five years by that point. Mm -hmm. So it's not as if I hadn't had rejection already and I thought I was finally getting somewhere. Sure. Um, anyway, so it didn't happen. But because of all the positive feedback, I really do believe in this book. And, mm. and I knew myself that it was a good, you know, a good book and that I was pleased with it and proud of it and that it deserves to be out there as much as, you know, more than arguably than some books out there sure, and as yeah. much as plenty of other books out there. So, um, sort of, yeah, I carried on trying various avenues. Um, and then in the end, I uh, submitted it to Unbound, who are a crowdfunded publisher in the UK. Um, I don't know. Do, do you do you want me to explain? Yeah, a bit about yeah, explain that. Yeah, because I think a lot of people probably won't be. Uh, the only reason that I'm aware about it is, I think I mentioned to you before, is because um, I've seen a couple of other authors on Twitter trying to you know mm -hmm. uh, get projects off the ground through it and different things e even people that are already traditionally published but they might have like a passion project or something else that's kind of a little bit um away from the norm shall we say or, or yeah. something that their publisher might not be interested in or they don't think that yeah. they could necessarily sell or whatever so i've kind of heard about it in as much as that but in terms of like how the submission process works mm -hmm. or what it is you know i'm familiar with crowdfunding in general but not not so familiar with that so yeah tell us a little bit about how that works so you submit your book to Unbound pretty much in any way that you would submit to uh, to any publisher that where you can sub submit directly to them, not via an agent, because there sure. are some small publishers out there you can do that with. Um, and alongside your novel or your idea or your nonfiction memoir or whatever it is that you're submitting, you also submit uh, a load of ideas for rewards that you can give to people who pre-order your book, kind mm -hmm. of Kickstarter style. Mm -hmm. um, and then just as with everything else, you wait. Um, mm -hmm. And in my case, I waited two and a half, three months. Um, and I got an email saying that they wanted to take it on. Um, and that was that was basically a month ago. That was January. Um, and so then it takes a while to get your page up and running. And what you have to do at that point is basically start crowdfunding as if as if you are on Kickstarter or something like that. Sure, but the yeah. difference is that they are also a publisher. So once the book is published, they kick in as a more or less traditional publisher. And, the you know, a lot of people who work for Unbound have worked for other publishers before. Then they're, they're not kind of mavericks who don't know what they're doing. They sure, they yeah. they've you know, they've put out other books before they've unbound itself has had some great successes with, um, most notably the good immigrant by Nikesh Shukla a couple of years ago. Um, but you know, they've had books, um, shortlisted for prizes and they've had bestsellers. So yeah. And the idea, I think, it, well, I don't think I know the, the <laughs> idea is that publishing traditional publishing is notoriously risk averse. And one of the reasons mm. for that is that they have to make back the money that they, pay out to the author basically sure, yeah. um if they give you an advance for a hundred thousand pounds and then you sell five books and they've lost a hundred thousand pounds basically sure. um whereas unbound will take on an idea that maybe they're not sure it's going to work but they know they're not going to lose out because unless it's unless they've basically covered their costs they're not going to publish it and so once the costs are covered they're like well we don't there's no reason to not take this risk because we already you know we're not going to lose so that's kind of the idea of it yeah like any kind of as you say like any kind of kickstarter campaign i mean a lot a lot of the way that the model really is it's a pre-sale model isn't it is yeah. it's essentially you're pre-selling a certain amount of copies so that you say the initial investment's kind of covered that's kind of how it works yes. yeah. yeah so it's good so um this show will actually be going out now it's scheduled to, to go out well next week as we record this but february the 27th okay. so Given that, so how is there like a, a time limit on? Have you got like a date a date set for when um, the the uh, the campaign ends, or how does that work? So I don't think there's an actual limit. Um, originally, it used to be that you had to get them done within three months, but I don't think that that's the case anymore. Um, but obviously, the quicker it gets funded, the quicker it's, it gets published. I'm on 44% as we speak. I can see it peeking through, <laughs> so, <laughs> peeking yeah. through the Skype window. Yeah. Um, and so I'm doing really well. And the, the other thing with uh, crowdfunding or with this model is that the more buzz you get, the more likely it is that other dominoes will fall in place. So if Unbound can say she was fully funded within two months or something like that, sure. that helps with, you know, getting a, maybe getting an American deal or maybe getting all kinds of other, you're getting coverage in the press. Sure. Um, 
so momentum is really important even if it a lot of people they take it maybe a year or six months or something but i really want to get this done as quickly as possible so that a because quite frankly i'm a bit bored of waiting of being <laughs> to be published <laughs> but also because i want this book to i want people to be talking about this book and i want it to be sort of on the front foot and to have the best chance possible of succeeding of course i mean did you ever consider obviously you kind of looked at traditional publishing for a while and all that kind of thing did yeah. you ever cons- consider independently publishing it yourself trying to get it get it out there you know just get it out there sort of thing yeah i would have that was going to be my next port of call after this if this hadn't worked mm-hmm. um because I actually, I heard you talking on the in, on the in the introduction of the most recent mm-hmm. episode about your different thought process. Yeah, sure. Um, Self publishing has changed so much over the years in terms of how people see it, and certainly when I was starting to write, it was it was very much looked down on. Oh, absolutely. Uh, yeah. and, and now much less so. And I've actually self published a couple of non fiction books mm-hmm. because I just I knew what I wanted to do with them, and I couldn't be bothered with you know waiting mm. two years. And, for there's, a, and there's a, well, the thing with non fiction as well is it's funny because uh, same sort of thing. I'm having the same conversation. I'm, I'm co writing a non fiction book, mm-hmm. and uh, we're we're pretty much sure that that's the route that we're going to go. But it is a little bit different, isn't it? Because with nonfiction, it's like, well, there's a need for this particular book. This this book fulfills yes. that specific need. And yeah. that there's that market over there and I'll sell to these people. Yes. Whereas yes. fiction's, it's like, you know, it's just not like that, is it? The books that fund incredibly fast on Unbound do tend to be nonfiction because it's like, oh, here's a book about this one thing that X amount of people are excited about. And it doesn't really matter who's writing the book because if you're interested in that thing that very niche thing that somebody is writing about, then you're going to be interested in the book. With fiction, it's a bit more difficult because I'm telling a story. You're buying into me telling you a story. And if you don't know me, then how do you know that I'm going to tell you a good story? Yeah. Um, so it is trickier. And I think and self-publishing for the same reason, I think, is trickier. Now, the problem with doing it now, even though there is much... Um, less looked down on now is that there's also so many so many self-published books out there and visibility is just you know next to next to non-existent yeah Yeah. um that said this book i believe in this book i think it's good enough that if nobody in the traditional or semi-traditional industry wanted it it's good enough to be out there so i would have put it out there in the end Mm. um but i do i mean sorry sorry go go on no go on I was going to say, I mean, the dream is my, you know, my book in shops and a book signing and, you know, people to walk past and go like, hmm, I know her, I went to school with her, maybe yeah, I'll buy of her course. books. Yeah, yeah, That's the dream. Yeah. Um, and that's, you know, self-publishing is almost that, but it's not quite that. And I really do want that one day i think yeah i mean again i think it depends on the kind of platform that you've got and i know everyone i hate that word because everyone talks about yeah. it you've got to have a good <laughs> platform um but you know obviously you i mean i will talk about this in a second obviously you, you part of that is you've got you've got a you're a podcaster now you've got your the brit lip podcast and stuff like that that is part of your visibility and mm-hmm. you know reaching more people and speaking to you know more people in the industry and things like that and i think if you if if it's over a longer period of time and you've had a chance to build to build that and the same goes for people that have been traditionally published and and have already got a bit of a um they've got a bit of momentum and they've got a bit of a, an audience that's already there yeah. waiting for this stuff i think yes. to me it's kind of like if you if you're out of contract you know why wouldn't you independently publish in that in that instance if you can reach yeah. your market and you can go directly to them because you know, you're in complete control of the whole thing. Yes, but I still think you. I still, obviously, the other the other issue with it is there is a as well as the time investment of it. There is the financial investment of it. Yes, not everybody has hundreds and hundreds of pounds to to shell out for a professional editor and yeah. cover art and everything else. Yeah, I mean, of course, the great myth of self publishing is that it's free. Mm. Um, it's not entirely a myth because it you can just sling something you up. Can, <laughs> yes, but. Um, if you if you want to stand out for, from the crowd or even look vaguely professional, you've got to invest. Mm. You know, even a good cover design can cost hundreds of pounds. Mm. Um, and cover designs are important because they're what people, you know, they're what people see, they, and that's they how they do a lot judge of the book by its cover. Yeah. They do, and I do it. <laughs> yeah, Most people everybody do does. It. Yeah. Um, and you know, yeah, it is. It is. Exp- and I could have also, the other thing I did consider was self-publishing using Kickstarter, mm. um, but which would have helped 
a little bit with some of the costs. Um, but I do think that having Unbound behind me as a legit publisher mm. who are, you know, ha- are well regarded in the UK, mm. They were interviewed on uh, the BBC Books and Authors podcast, which is the holy grail of book mm. podcasts, as far yeah. as I'm concerned. Yeah. Um, you know, I, they are legit. And I think that that helps people have confidence in the process and that I'm going to turn out a good book. OK, let's take a very quick break for Book Bloggers Corner, which comes from show regular Victoria Goldman. Victoria is a freelance health journalist and editor, as well as an avid book reviewer. She blogs at Off the Shelf Books, which features reviews and interviews with authors, publishers, editors and agents. You can also find her on Twitter at Victoria Goldmar 2, where she's always sharing great content, like her publishing life series, so go and look her up. Today she reviews Sweet Pea by C.J. Skews. This is the BBC Book Bloggers Corner. Today I'm reviewing Sweet Pea by C.J. Skews. I hope I've pronounced that name right, so apologies if I haven't. The book has a long blurb, so I won't read all of it, but here's the first part. The last person who called me Sweet Pea ended up dead. I haven't killed anyone for three years, and I thought that when it happened again I'd feel bad, like an alcoholic taking a sip of whiskey. But no, nothing. I had a blissful night's sleep, didn't wake up at all, and for once, no bad dream either. This morning I feel balanced, almost sane, for once. Rhiannon is your average girl next door, settled with her boyfriend and little dog. But she's got to kill a secret. So what did I think of Sweet Pea? Well, I found it to be a very entertaining crime thriller and highly addictive. I was recommended the book when I asked on Twitter for the audiobook equivalent of A Book You Can't Put Down, and I certainly wasn't disappointed. Sweet Pea is quite outrageous with some explicit descriptions and very dark humour. I don't usually warn people about book content, but this is certainly not a book for the faint-hearted or easily offended. I loved every minute of it and every word. I mention every word, as every word has a purpose and a place in this book, designed to shock, tease or make the reader chuckle or gasp. I listened to the audiobook while I was out and about walking and had some very odd looks from passers-by as I couldn't stop laughing. I have been known to read my Kindle when I go for a walk, but there was no way I could have read Sweet Pea while on the move. I would probably have walked into every lamppost and maybe ended up run over too. I did switch to the Kindle version eventually. More about that shortly. Rhiannon, the protagonist, is a serial killer with a distinctive, compelling voice. You're in her head the whole time. She's sharp, witty, sarcastic, highly critical of others, to the point of wanting most people dead, and a psychopath, which she readily admits in her head, though not to anyone out loud, obviously. I loved all of the other characters, even the ones I possibly wasn't meant to love. Sweet Pea was brought to life brilliantly by the audiobook narrator Georgia Maguire. Georgia was perfect for the job with her different voices and accents. I had planned to listen to the whole audiobook, but switched to the Kindle version at around 70%, because my listening time was more limited over Christmas and the New Year, and I couldn't wait to get to the end of this book to discover what happened. When I switched back to the Kindle version, it was Georgia's voices that I heard in my head as I read. I don't want to give anything away about the plot, but knowing Rhiannon is a serial killer trying to live a normal life probably gives you an idea about the content. To summarise, I thought that Sweet Pea is unique and brilliant. It's also gruesome and disturbing. The book was published in November 2017 by HQ Stories. The sequel, called In Bloom, is being published in August 2018. Book Bloggers Corner OK, that was Sweet Pea by CJ Skews, as reviewed by Victoria Goldman. Thanks, Victoria. Right, back to my chat with Claire, where I asked her about her writing process. So in terms of the actual writing process, do, do you, how do you approach that? Do you, uh, you know, have you got a very clear idea of where you want the story to go before you start writing? Do you make detailed notes or do you just go, well, I've got this idea and a rough idea where I'm going and off you go? I mean, speaking as somebody, you're speaking as somebody that's done NaNoWriMo at least three times, so. (laughs) (laughs) 
Um, I think with all my books, NaNoWriMo and otherwise, and this one actually wasn't a, wasn't a NaNoWriMo one, um, I always, I think it's fair to say, I always uh, have an idea of the characters first mm-hmm. and of the general arc of things. And I usually will have three or four key scenes in my head um, at the beginning. But aside from that, I sort of just write. And I, um, I'm i somebody who doesn't write enough for my first draft. My first drafts are too short, and then I have to go back and sort of Put you know, stuff add in, yeah. in stuff, yeah. which that's a bit of a challenge because the last thing you want to do is just pad. It's got to be organic, and it's got to be important and all this kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, so, and I, I handwrite, uh, usually I handwrite and I handwrite using these notebooks where you can move the pages around. So, um, oh, I, I do see. that well, as sort well. of clipped in like a bind, like a, almost like a file effects type thing or. Um, kind of. There's, there's actually oh, I haven't a special... seen those before. Right. Okay. Well, they're, <laughs> this is very esoteric, <laughs> but they're actually, they're from Belgium. They have this system, um, they're called well the, it's the atoma system and it's right. this special they're the special rings basically that you can pull out and put back in and there's this particular brand of them that has really like soft nice paper which is important to me so i have these very specific notebooks that i use and i tend to not necessarily write in order so i will write whatever scene i want to write that day and then move it around and that whole physical process of moving things around is definitely part of the whole thing for me. So that's really interesting. Yeah. Maybe you should throw some of those books into your rewards packages on your Unbound. Uh, maybe campaign. <laughs> I didn't think about that. Maybe I should. Yeah, <laughs> they actually sound they actually sound really interesting. Um, yeah, they're great. It's sort, it's, sort, it's sort of like an analog version of Scrivener. To my, in my mind, it's like the fact that you yeah. can just grab scenes and move things around and stuff like yeah. that. Um, yeah. yeah, so we mentioned there uh, a little bit before, we mentioned uh, about BritLit, the BritLit podcast. So tell tell us about that and how you became a podcaster. Yeah, so I've been listening to podcasts for at least eight years. Um, I started with politics and books. They mm-hmm. were my two main kinds of podcasts. They still are my main kinds of po- podcasts that I listen to. Um, and about... Uh, sorry, about five years ago, I discovered the uh, Book Riot podcast, mm-hmm. which is um, a show about well, what they call it is a show about what's new, cool, and worth talking about in the world in the world of books and reading. Mm-hmm. And it's but it's what well, they say the world, but as Americans often mean when they say the world, they mean, <laughs> they mean the America. American world. Yeah, yeah. Um, so it's a great podcast about sort of the ins and outs of the publishing industry and you know, what books abandoned, what schools and what we should do about it and um, uh, what Amazon are up to and why that's good or bad, you know, what what independent bookshops are doing and why that's good or bad and, you know, um, new books coming out and things like that. And it's a great podcast and I love it. Um, but I, there was nothing like it for the UK that I could figure out. Mm-hmm. Um, and I uh, realized a couple of years ago that because I listen to this podcast and I now write for Book Riot as well, um, I'm very deep in the American publishing industry. I get a lot of advanced review copies, which is wonderful. I'm mm-hmm. not complaining for one second about that. I love that. Um, and I know what's coming out. And I've got my finger on the pulse. So all everything I was reading was American. And I, But I didn't even realize <laughs> it's just how it was. Yeah. And then at the end of 2016, when I realized that I hadn't read a British book and I didn't know how long, I kind of thought, well, that's not OK. Um, <laughs> so I started I ra- started the blog, the BritLit blog, where I round up basically daily news and views from British publishing. Mm-hmm. Um, and then my plan was always to start a podcast as well on the back of that. But I didn't really know how and I was a bit scared by the technical aspects of it. Um, but I discovered a Facebook group. I discovered you could pay someone to edit your podcast. So <laughs> I decided I would I would take the plunge. So, yeah, so I interview um, somebody from the publishing industry, often authors, but sometimes people from a bookshop or um, I have a publicist I'm interviewing soon, sort of different aspects of mm. their publishing industry. Um and I talk about their writing, or if that's relevant, or the, and or their reading. Um, I always ask people what they're excited to read next and what they've loved recently. Because my aim is to really sort of uh, showcase British books to 
the rest of the was specifically to the US, but to the rest of the world. Um, and then I also talk about new books coming out because I don't I don't know of any other British podcast that talks specifically. Okay, this week these are the books coming out. Um, yeah, sure. This is yeah. what you should look out for. So yeah, so that's what I do, and it's a lot of fun. It's very time consuming, um, <laughs> but too, it's yeah. what wonderful to get to speak to people I admire and and also now this means that I get advanced reviews copies from the UK as well which is amazing yeah so, so yeah it's great it's great so yeah you mentioned it's time consuming yeah I, I concur I agree on that <laughs> and so um so your Brit list Brit lit comes out is it every other week isn't it is that right yeah, it's every other Thursday, um, designed to be Thursdays because that's when most books come out in the UK. Um, so the idea is you can listen to it on your commute and then you'd be like, oh, I heard about this book on the Reddit podcast that yeah. just came out. I can run to my bookshop yeah, exactly, today. Yeah. Um, I don't know when that's actually what people do, but that's kind of my... <laughs> who, who knows my... when people listen to podcasts? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> exactly. everyone's different, but yeah. it's Well, it's a yeah. great little show, so uh, good luck with it. It's, it's fa- fairly... When did you stay, say that you started it? It's quite recent, yeah. isn't it? pretty new so i started in october and it's only it's fortnightly because i didn't know if i'd be able to, to sustain weekly mm. um so it's it's only had about 12 episodes um but yeah i'm enjoying it yeah it's great well keep keep up the good work so so what's up next after um after unscripted have you got are you on the next book or what what's occurring with that well, I'm not actually writing anything right now, partly because I have so many other balls in the air that I just I just don't think that I can deal with it. Mm-hmm. Um, but I try and I'm trying to write something. Allegedly, most days I'm failing right now, but my my plan <laughs> is to not I don't want to get to the stage where like I wake up and think, oh, it's three months since I wrote anything. Um, so even if it's just a five minute writing exercise, I want to try and do that as often as I can just to keep my hand, you know, in the game. Um, but in terms of writing an actual novel, I haven't got any plans yet, although I am noodling on a NaNoWriMo project um as we record this it's the day after the um ice dancing finals in the uh, olympics right. yeah. and i don't know whether this was a thing in the uk too but it as certainly where i was we were all absolutely obsessed with um the ice dancing couple from canada right. who may or may not be a couple but like they exude sexual passion so it, it, like... got, it got the gears going yeah <laughs> so yeah so i mean every every i say everybody on my personal Twitter feed. So people <laughs> like me are sort of, you know, obsessed with them and they want they want romance novels about ice dancers. So I'm like, well, I might give that a go during that. There might be a moment. niche there, yeah. There might be, <laughs> might be, there might be an angle, exactly. yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, but that's just, you know, that's just for fun and it's February, so who knows if I'll do it in November. But um, I have a couple of other novels that I wrote after Unscripted, one of which is quite similar in theme, but um, very different in style. And I'm trying to see where I get with that um, in terms of publishing. And then I also have another novel, which is a YA novel, which is actually, it's kind of a sequel to Unscripted. It takes one of the characters from Unscripted and tells her story. So it is a sequel, but she's not really... Um, not, she's not really in Unscripted. Sure? So she's the daughter of the actor, basically. So in Unscripted, she's 12. And my YA novel um, is, so far, it's called Girl Unstrung. And it's her sort of two years later. So some of the same characters recur, but it's a very different I see, story. Yeah, yeah. Um, so that's kind of, that was my that was my NaNoWriMo last year. Um, so I've edited that quite a lot already. So I'm kind of going to be trying to pitch that at some point as well. Um, to various places like who knows how that's gonna go so lots lots Um, of irons in the fire yes lots of irons (laughs) excellent so where can people find you and your work online and obviously just reiterate where they can head off to unbound to check out unscripted and get their hands on some of those rewards and support your project yeah, so the easiest thing uh Google wise is if you do if you type in unscriptednovel.com then that points you straight to the right unbound page um, for my book or just go to unbound and do some searching, but that might be a bit more effort. Um, <laughs> and then online, you can find me various places. Um, uh, Brit Lit podcast on Twitter and Instagram. Um, and you can follow the breadcrumbs from there to my personal accounts, um, of which I have several. It's a long story. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> so, yeah. 
Brilliant. Well, that's excellent. Well, thanks so much for taking the time to uh, talk to us. Good luck with the project. Look forward to seeing it when it's out and it's it's in print and you've got all these uh, reviews and everything else. And I walk past the shop window and it's in there. I'm sure it'll happen. <laughs> Thank you so much. And in the meantime, for now anyway, thanks a lot, Claire. Thanks so much for having me. There you go. That's Claire Hanscom. And I encourage you to go and check out her book, Unscripted, over at Unbound and grab yourself one of those special rewards as well as supporting a new author. And I'll put all of those links in the show notes over at joinedupwriting.co.uk. That wraps things up for another week. But don't forget, you can find the entire back catalogue of interviews on our website. Also, take a moment to leave a quick iTunes rating and review. Like books, podcasts thrive on reviews. So if you want to support the podcast for free, head over to iTunes right now. In the meantime, thanks for listening. I'm Wayne Kelly. Happy writing and reading, and I'll see you next time. Joined up.